you know, Charlie, with, with your obvious connection to Mark Knopfler, I mean, when you first heard that record, you know, the, that the demo of Sounds of Swing, Sounds of Swing. What, what, I mean, that, that had to have been the same kind of thing that people like George Harrison and Keith Richards talk about in hearing Scotty Moore. I know it was for me. Well, it was uh, slightly different for me. I'd been playing um, two people at the time. J.J. Kale, who isn't that kind of a kind of virtuoso, but he has a lovely sound. And in the early 70s, he was, he was to me a sort of saving grace in the midst of the British pop music at that time was particularly crass, and so I particularly liked him. He sounds a, a little bit sleepy when I listen to him now, but it, it, things have their time and their context. But the other group was the Amazing Rhythm Aces, who, funnily enough, are from Memphis. And uh, their guitarist, now is it Russell Smith, is he the guitarist? Uh, Barry Burton. Barry Burton. Their guitarist was, I thought, he, if, you know, so if I was going to, you know, back to my family tree, I got Scotty Moore, I got Barry Burton, a Memphis guitarist in, what, 75, 76, around there. And Mark definitely, Mark definitely listened to Barry Burton, he knew all about it. But there's an irony there, and I, I hate to interrupt on film, but, you know, that, that there's a connection with all three. I mean, Mark obviously listened to J.J. Kale, and uh, the Amazing World of Mesas were J.J. Kale's backing band. Oh, I didn't know that. And they were, you know, they were all connected there. Okay. And uh, okay. and then Eric Clapton was the first person to ever bring a J.J. Kale record over to England with After Midnight. That was a J.J. Kale That's song. Right. That's right. And so, so it all does fit mm -hmm. together. And mm -hmm. I've always wondered if Mark would be offended by mentioning J.J. Cale, because so He many definitely wouldn't be offended by J.J. Cale. He'd be a little touchy about Barry Burton. Oh, who just passed away. No. Yeah. As well as Butch Day, McDade. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. And, uh, brain cancer, no. Oof. But on a happier note, I, I just thought I'd throw that in there. But, uh, well, what, what was it about Sultans of Swing that, you know, that did it for you? Uh... I mean, I, in in this, well, we are, where are we? 1977. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd been doing my radio show by five year, for five years by then, and I'd started out just wanting to play all this stuff that I'd been discovering over the previous previous 15 years that kind of I, I I had I hadn't known existed at the at the time that it originally surfaced, and just sort of say to, and I'd written this book which sort of tried to pull the strings together, but there's a, a much more effective way of getting people to share your your pleasure that instead of trying to write about it, is just play the damn thing and let, say listen to this so uh, and the th within a few weeks of starting in March of 72 I started getting tapes well originally a tape and then another tape and then it became a regular thing from musicians b based in London who were you know recording whatever you know, just trying to do gigs and uh, one or two of them <coughs> excuse me actually led to record deals, including uh, Graham Parker, are you familiar with him? He's a good friend of mine. Well, he sent me, well, the guy who, who recorded his first demo sent it in, and that's how he got his record deal. Really? And, um, so it was 76. A guy who was called D.P. Costello at the time, who had a voice like Tim Hardin, as far as I was concerned, which was fine by me, because I loved Tim Hardin. So I played these things that he'd recorded in his bed, on, on his sitting on his bed, and uh, his, his wife has always said that that was like just the high point of his life up until that point was to hear his own voice on the radio, and he he then got this picked up by Stiff Records, who called him Elvis Costello. So by the time, but so as these st things started to happen, more tapes started to come in, and obviously they weren't all equally good. So when one guy called me up, he was somebody who worked at a record shop in Kentish Town who used to periodically call up and say, somebody came in the shop and they were asking after this record you played. And one day he said, having dealt with that business, he said, I'm in this band and we've got a, we've just done, we're, just, we're just going into the eight track studio, can we come round with the tape when we've done it? Or we, can we bring, you know, give you the tape? Uh, you know, I, I, I would always say, yeah, send me the tape without any expectation. So on a Thursday, this is when I've got the show Sunday lunchtime. I'm sitting upstairs. At that time, my 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 room is upstairs, and the knock on the front door. I come down. These two guys standing there with the tape, and this is John, and this is Mark, and this is the tape. And I say, well, thanks very much. I've just finished planning my show, so I don't expect to hear it this week, but I'll listen to it. But in fact, I was curious, so I did put it on. I thought, wow, this this. All I thought was, well, this is too good not to play t on Saturday. So I pulled something else out and played this one on Sunday. 
and uh, during the show three different A&R people rang up when I got home in the afternoon another three and during the week another three so this was like I never in all my time in radio had ever had a reaction like this and still never again I was walking out in Charing Cross Road and somebody stopped me and said that band you and I how does this but I'm on the radio how does this person know who I am you know what I mean it's like what so all I could do is the next Saturday sun, Sunday say well you all like that one here's the next one on the tape there were five songs on the tape so I played each week for the next five weeks all you know each song and then I started back at the beginning and played them all over again over a ten week stretch and, and it took a kind of hunk of their life where they'd expected to slog around the pubs of London for the next year or so trying to get somebody interested suddenly they could walk around the business and, and discuss whether they were going to be signed up or not now as it happened <coughs> each of these people who had called up and was listening to my show none of them was the senior person in the company they were just whoever was listening W with the exception of one person, they could not persuade their bosses that this was worth anything. This was 1977. Everybody was looking for the next punk band. So uh, by the time I'd gone through all this, you know, again, it's like your, your question was, when I first heard the record, you know, I, I, all I knew was it was good enough to play instead of whatever I was going to play. I didn't know this was a record that was going to be a, a launch, a new band that was going to be going for the next. You don't know these things. You just know it sounds nice to you. Chris Bing Island Records had tried to push Che J.K. and put out two, through, through Shelter Records. So when somebody walks into the studio with into the, his office with a band and say, "This is this brilliant new band from Britain," he said, I, "Why do I need an American, a British version of something I can't sell even the original of it?" So it was ridiculous because they would have been the perfect band on Island Records. Uh, so nobody knows. I, I, you know, you just do not know. You just go. You just, you just react. You like what you like, and you don't like what you don't like. And it's very dangerous to think you know anything more than that.